From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Good afternoon and welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm your host for the next hour, Ciara Speller. The issues surrounding hunger and food insecurity continue to grow in our region. One local organization, Rachel's Table, has been at the forefront of the fight against hunger for over 30 years. In July of 2023, they became their own nonprofit organization, doubling their impact while doing so. What started as a way to help families in need in Springfield and Longmeadow has grown to encompass three western Massachusetts counties and parts of Connecticut. This week on 22 News in Focus, we're talking with representatives from Rachel's Table about their programs. So joining me now is Jody Falk, Executive Director of Rachel's Table of Western Massachusetts. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you for having us. So let's start with some background on Rachel's Table. Okay, so Rachel's Table is a food rescue and hunger alleviation program in existence since 1992. And we are, uh, we, we just help get people get food. We, there were some amazing, smart, caring women who decided their surplus food going to waste, going to a landfill, and there was hungry people, and that should never exist in the same world. So your mission is to make sure that, you know, no one in our area goes hungry. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and so also, you know, what are the four food programs of your organization? So thank you for asking because we have expanded since that first time in 1992 when primarily our program was rescue, which is still a very strong program that we do. Take food that would go to landfill instead, take it and bring it to people. We also have a purchase program where we purchase food for people and for our agencies, exactly what they're asking for. And we have our gleaning program, which harvests food from local farms and we have our garden program. All of our programs are meant to either serve the most immediate crisis need or longer term sustainable solutions to support food, sec food security for the future. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the you know, short term crisis need or the longer term sustainable options. Absolutely, so the option of um, the short term need, first of all, let's talk about the need. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Greater Boston Food Bank says that one in three households in Western Massachusetts are food insecure. Now that's not a statistic we wanna keep seeing. Um, and that the need for all of our, the agencies that we've talked to, it's about the same level as the height of the pandemic. So we really need to keep moving and doing our work. Um, so we, 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 the rescue program brings food right away, every single day, six days a week. And our garden program, for instance, works towards bringing people closer to the source of food and giving them full access. So that's a longer term solution, people growing their own food rather than us giving them food. Yeah, and you know, it's pretty jarring to think that, you know, if you're in a large group of people, right, there are inevitably, inevitably going to be somebody in that group that is, is hungry, you know? So um, it's important to know about these resources that you guys are offering. So how can people learn more about what you do? So our website, feedwma.org, is a place to learn all about us. It's a place to learn how to support us and help our work. You can give your funds. You can, we always uh, accept financial donation. You can give your food if you're a business. You can help us buy your leftover food. Um, and you can also give your time. We have an amazing volunteer base. As a matter of fact, I always like to say, the volunteers are our superpower. So we do it, we are volunteer driven. We have amazing, wonderful volunteers. And we also have a teen board, which you're gonna learn a little bit later about tonight. And how about uh, community partners? So our community, par so, so I wanted to say nobody does this alone, mm -hmm. right? We're all in partnership to make this work. So we have over 65 recipient agencies where the food goes across Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties. We have over 70 food donors, and that includes our local farms. We have, we are also a transportation partner of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, where we drive some of their food to the agencies. Last year, we drove over 300,000 pounds of food for the food bank. We also complement the food bank in that some of our um, food goes to agencies that are not served by the food bank. So all of us together make this work, and we're all needed to, fill to, to make our ourselves and make our communities food secure. And how much food would you say, you know, annually that you collect and distribute? Mm. So in 2023, we collected and distributed over 760,000 pounds of food. And for, um, since we started with our refrigerated van, which volunteers drive as lo along with their volunteer cars, um, since that time in October 2022 until 
the end of April, we distributed over 1.1 million pounds of food. And how does somebody go about getting involved and wanting to donate food? So businesses uh, donate food for us. We can, the only place we cannot take is from is a personal kitchen. But if you are a food business, if you're a supermarket, if you're a, um, a deli, a bakery, um, a restaurant, mm -hmm. and you have an event or you have leftover food, you call us. We have a, a food donation hotline. And then the next day, one of our uh, drivers will pick it up for si six days a week. And um, you know, tell us about if you're seeing an increased need in the demand for food. Of course, you know, we're dealing with inflation. We're dealing with hard times. You know, post COVID, a lot of things haven't gone back to normal for a lot of people. So tell us about that. That's right. So um, as I was saying, the agencies have told us that it, it's not gone down. As a matter of, in some places it's increased. And we are continuing to, to have to get, move more and more food. Um, it's, it's not a problem that's going away. And that's, that's scary, mm -hmm. actually. But what we're trying to do and I know a lot of agencies are trying to do is address the problem in a longer term solution, not just this quick, let's mm -hmm. quickly feed people. We are doing that. And we're also looking, how do we address root causes? How do we look at this problem from many angles? And, and as we like to say, we have a holistic approach to looking at how do we try to um, have a food secure future in the longer term. And what about the demographic? Is it a specific demographic that you're seeing more of a need or is it kind of just, you know, across the board? It, it is across mm -hmm. the board, which is, um, tells you that we're in a system, right, where, there's, where the inflation is really affecting everybody. And, you know, how, again, individuals, businesses, community organizations, how can they provide support? So, again, go to our website, feedwma.org, learn about us, call us. Um, we have so many opportunities both to to help us financially and we actually have a race coming up uh, may 19th a 5k and a one mile walk you can come as a team come as an individual that helps uh, the, the the funds that are raised for that help us all year long um, and we have volunteer opportunities across the board in the office uh, on the road so many places we even have volunteer opportunities for corporate sponsors themselves to come as a team and help us out. There's so many ways because we always think Rachel's Table is an answer to the question, how do I help? Mm -hmm. And we have communities helping communities make ourselves uh, a better place to live and a more healthy place to live for all. Yeah, and the great thing about this community here in Western Massachusetts is I feel that everybody is so willing to help and wants to get involved or Absolutely. at least try to help spread the message as well. That's right, it's a wonderful place to live and let's make it continue to be a wonderful place for everybody to live. And so you mentioned that you have a race coming up. Mm -hmm. What other type of fundraising events do you do and what's your biggest of the year? So once a year we do a large fundraiser. This race happens to be our largest one this year. It's a biennial event. Mm -hmm. And the alternate years we have something called Bountiful Bowls, which is uh, an evening, entertainment, and honoring people. And that also um, is our large fundraiser that particular year. We have small fundraisers fundraisers throughout the year we um, but really truly our focus is our mission and our goal and doing our work so um, that I I the, the more folks can just help us do that work whether they want to volunteer their time their treasure or their talent mm -hmm. that will get the work job done I covered the Bountiful Bowls event one year you when did. I was a reporter you and did. I had the, a beautiful blue bowl at you my did. desk that I, I keep in you know I'm I so think glad. of you guys yeah I'm so glad yeah. you keep it that's <laughs> that's a, to, in order to fill the bowls of yes. those in need absolutely yes and lastly just for our viewers who might be tuning in again you know just tell us a little bit about what Rachel's Table does for our community so Rachel's Table is the 31 year old organization and, and also brand new because we became our own nonprofit in July as you said earlier um, we are a food rescue and hunger alleviation program and we are a volunteer driven and we work across Hamden, Hampshire and Franklin counties to make sure there is a food secure Pioneer Valley. And social media is really big right now. So are you on social media we platforms? Are, absolutely. Okay. Thank you for saying that. We're on Facebook or on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on LinkedIn. And <laughs> our teen board also has its own Instagram page and they, they do TikTok as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I know. Got it, I know. Got it all covered. So Everybody who's watching our show can find you very easily. That's right. Rachel's Table of Western Massachusetts. And just please find us because we, we always need more volunteers. We always need some more help. This is a program, problem excuse me, that's not going away. And therefore, we need to lift it all up together. All right, Jody. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you so much. Food recovery through crop gleaning is one way that Rachel's Table produces food for distribution. We'll have that conversation when we return. 
You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about the work being done at Rachel's Table, an organization that provides food programs that fight hunger. One of their programs fits well with our local agricultural scene, the gleaning of produce. So joining me now is Kara Michelle Silverberg, Rachel's Table Director of Intercultural Learning and Land-Based Programs, and Sarah Bluestein, Rachel's Table Gleaning Assistant. Thanks so much for you both being here today. Thanks for having Thank us. You. So let's start with what is gleaning? Gleaning is an ancient cultural practice of harvesting food that's left over in fields by and for people who are vulnerable and food insecure. And what does, you know, who does the gleaning? So when we glean, um, we are coming from a cultural tradition that is near and dear to us as a Jewish organization. Um, and at the same time, we recognize that people from many different cultures um, throughout history and presently have different ways of gleaning food and caring for the people in their communities who need that food. Um, so when we glean, we are working with people in our community who themselves are impacted by food insecurity as well as people who uh, just want to volunteer and work with us. Yeah, and gleaning exists worldwide in a number of different forms. And in the U.S., there are over 200 gleaning organizations who are all connected through networks and professional conferences and share information that can be locally relevant to their programs. So we're part of a large community. And is there a specific time that gleaning takes place, and how is that organized? Sure, gleaning happens mm -hmm. from July through November. Um, that is our main gleaning season mm -hmm. because that's the growing season where we live. Do you want to speak to more of yeah. how it works? Yeah, how our program works is we have a number of farmer partners. This last uh, year in 2023, we worked with 13 farmer partners. And when they're done harvesting a specific crop, say carrots, they'll send us a message to either Kara or I, and they'll say, we're done with carrots. Would you like to come harvest what we weren't able to pick or what we have left? Mm -hmm. And then um, we'll send out an email to our network of gleaning volunteers, and we'll say, who's available to harvest carrots at, on Tuesday at mm -hmm. 2 p.m.? And people will sign up, and we'll send out information, and then um, one of our staff members, usually Kara or myself, will show up with about an average, I would say, of 12 volunteers. We'll all spend two hours picking carrots, having a really nice time, chatting, getting to be farmers for a little bit. <laughs> and then we'll weigh all the carrots and we'll distribute them and we'll be in contact with one of our many partner agencies, or several of our partner agencies. And our gleaners, or sometimes the Rachel's Table delivery van, will deliver the carrots all over the Pioneer Valley. So it's kind of all in one day. Yeah. We get them where they're going. A lot involved in that. Yeah. There's a lot involved in that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so tell us, you know, when was this pre uh, program created and how has it evolved over the years? Sure. So in 2007, the director of Rachel's Table at that time, Debbie Rubenstein, had the seed of an idea to do this gleaning thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the long term beloved volunteers of Rachel's Table, B. Lovey, uh, took on that vision and developed a program. She brought on a local agricultural educator, Jessica Harwood, who coordinated this program for many years after that. Um, and in those early years, they built some strong relationships with local farms that built a foundation for how this program has grown. When they started, they really focused on educational groups. Um, so for example, youth groups from um, synagogues or churches, scout groups um, to come out, glean food, and learn about food insecurity. We still do that, we still have private groups that come out with us, but we've also shifted our focus to not only have private groups coming out, but to also have open community gleans. Mm -hmm. Sarah can share more about that in a moment, but I'll just say with the private groups, one of our, our real foci at this point is to bring in groups that are working with the issue of food insecurity in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. Rather than just a one-off where they come once during the year and then forget about us, we want to work with people who are asking these questions and getting involved in community solutions at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just say about the Open Community Gleaning Program, coordinating that has been a big part of my job this past year. And with that growth, we were able to move from eight gleans in 2022 to 44 gleans in 2023. Wow. So we've really expanded in that way. And it's become a really special space where a lot of our volunteers would never have met outside of these gleans. Mm -hmm. And they've just come together through this shared love for you know getting to be outside picking food helping build our local food systems all these different reasons that b bring people there has really 
built this community of people who, especially last year in 2023, so many people were coming back every week and were really getting to know each other and connecting mm -hmm. in different ways. And part of our program also allows um, our volunteers to take food home with them, to distribute to their community, to their neighbors, to other people they know who might need that. And I think kind of adding that personalized level to the gleaning has been really meaningful. Like pe we're, we're always gleaning for our partner agencies, mm -hmm. and it's really special to have people connecting to also work on their own projects, a pop-up food pantry, just other ways that they're fighting food insecurity in their own lives. Yeah, do you have numbers on about how many pounds of food that you glean annually? Absolutely, so in those early years of the program, um, we, Rachel's Table, gleaned somewhere in the 8,000 to 9,000 mm -hmm. pounds of food per year range. Wow. Um, since 2001, we've been dramatically increasing. In 2022, we harvested uh, about 16,000, a little over 16,000 pounds. Last year, we harvested over 28,000 pounds. Um, and we have a goal to be around 36,000 pounds in the coming year. Yeah, and mm -hmm. how does gleaning benefit the participants? The farmers. Mm -hmm. So one of the major ways is, well, first of all, all of our farm partners are hugely supportive of our program, and for a variety of reasons, they're not picking the crops, but it's not for a lack of wanting to. Mm -hmm. Like They want this food to be going to people. So I think Rachel's Table really uniquely hits this demand where everyone involved would like this food to go to people, but f the farmers, maybe they don't have the labor, maybe it's overplanting for financial reasons. Like There's a lot of reasons that there's more food than they will be harvesting, but Rachel's Table is hitting this moment where just by doing a little bit of logistical coordination and with the help of our volunteers, we can come in and we can get this food that would otherwise be composted or tilled back into the ground to people who can really use it. So I think all the farmers we work with are hugely supportive of that and appreciative that we're able to make that connection. And then also everything that we donate, we weigh, we keep track of the poundage very carefully. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year, we send them a letter of everything they've donated that becomes tax deductible. Wow. So. Yeah. It's financially helpful as well. Yeah, and you know, the, the bigger you know, picture is that food is, it can go to waste so easily. So by having this program, food isn't going to waste, it's going to the people who really need it, and you know, that's what's important. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how it contributes to the local food system resilience. Sure, so one thing that we found this year as we really expanded our open community gleaning program is that people gave us the feedback that, uh, we, we heard things like, I never quite realized how much goes into producing food, mm -hmm. or I didn't realize just how talented farmers are, or wow, these farmers are so generous, <laughs> or wow, this land is so beautiful, how do we take care of it? Mm -hmm. So there were all these ways that stewardship of land, respect for farmers, um, and, and a desire to somehow give to a local agricultural system that can sustain itself and sustain our community in a healthy and resilient way, um, people just expressed that that, that, was, that was alive for them. Mm -hmm. And how many farms do you partner with? 13 this year, or mm -hmm. 13 in 2023. We're always looking to partner with new farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how would a farm you know, get involved with that? They could email either one of us, they could give us a call, um, mm -hmm. any of those. Um, yeah, they can reach out through the Rachel's yeah. Table website. Yeah, and yeah. How, how can our viewers help support your program? Come glean with us. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so much fun. We sent out a survey to all of our gleaners at the end of the year, and the biggest feedback was just how much fun people have gleaning. Yeah, yeah. do you go around to, to businesses, or you know, how, what's the best way um, to, to market you know, gleaning? Gleaners <laughs> are really great marketers. Yeah. <laughs> they post it on social media themselves. They mm -hmm. invite their friends and their family. They mm -hmm. come back time after time. Uh, we also have um, folks from different kinds of sports teams or universities mm -hmm. or different places who are interested in getting their people out. Um, so anyone can sign up to glean and really gleaners themselves have yeah. been spreading the word. Yeah, and also it's a very intergenerational community and I think there just aren't a lot of intergenerational spaces that exist like this where people can just connect with people they might never have met. Mm -hmm. And that was a really special part of last season was just watching everyone connect with each other. Thank you both so much for your insight on the program. Appreciate that. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. After the break, we'll be learning about the gardening program at Rachel's Table. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
We're back now with 22 News in Focus, and our topic today is the work being done by Rachel's Table and the support they provide to organizations that supply food to our neighbors in need. Another one of their programs focuses on growing food, especially appropriate foods, to address the needs of the culturally diverse communities in our region. Joining me now are Kara Mich uh, Michelle Silverberg, Director of Intercultural Learning and Land-Based Programs, and Jamie Waterman, Nutrition Director at the Boys and Girls Club of Chicopee, a partner of Rachel's Table in their Rescue and Garden programs. Thanks so much for staying on the program and joining us on the program. I'm glad to still be here. So, Kara, let's start with what is the Growing Garden program and why was it created? This program was created in 2021 to target that end of the spectrum that Jody spoke of earlier where we're not only addressing immediate hunger crises but we're also looking at long-term solutions that address root causes of hunger. And how does this program work? We invite agencies to join in a cohort each year. Uh, we currently have 11 agencies part of the program and each of those agencies receives um, support in the form of funding uh, for materials to build or expand gardens at their sites. We also provide mentoring through both our staff and our volunteers. And we also provide network gatherings, phone calls, workshops, trainings for them to develop their skills and knowledge sets. Mm -hmm. And how about your aims and your goals? Sure, this program, um, a main aim of it is to provide greater voice and choice for people who are directly impacted by food insecurity. Uh, we want people to be able to decide what they want to grow, what they want to eat, what they want to feed their families, um, to be able to prepare food together and share with their communities and to um, really be at the center of their own food futures. Mm -hmm. We also want to be supporting larger pictures of local food system resilience. And in terms of the garden, you know, how, how do you assess what size garden, what type of garden? Every agency is different. Mm -hmm. Every agency has its own goals and its own opportunities and challenges. Some agencies have um, a two or three bed garden where they're focusing on particular uh, foods that they know the children in their program will want to eat. Mm -hmm. Some agencies serve only adults and may have space just for containers and not entire beds. Some agencies, um, one agency, Jewish Family Service of Western Massachusetts that we're working with this year, they're creating take-home gardens. Mm -hmm. It's not about being at their site. Mm -hmm. um, they work with refugee and immigrant families, and so they're creating herb kits for those families to take home and to be able to grow in their own households. So every, every agency is really different, mm -hmm. and we work with them to assess what will work at their site and to honestly look at what their capacity is as a staff and volunteer network in, on their own um, so that we can support people in biting off just the right amount. And so this is a three-year cycle, so tell us about that. Sure, so when agencies come in, um, it takes a little while to just get an idea of what you're actually doing to figure it out. You might have a goal of how you're trying to serve your community. Maybe your garden is about producing as much food as possible for snack time. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about providing a safe space for youth after school. Maybe it's about providing socialization for seniors. Um, so when agencies come in, in the first year, we're really looking at articulating those goals and refining them and helping them to establish the infrastructure that they need to meet those goals. The second year, uh, we're working a lot on building specific knowledge and skill sets. Um, for example, crop planning or um, dealing with those little bugs. What are they and <laughs> how do I get rid of them? Um, what are activities that kids might want to do? Um, what are some special culturally relevant foods or crops that we don't have growing that we want to get growing and how can we grow them in this climate? So there's a lot of that kind of technical learning that comes in in the second year. And then in the third year, agencies are generally fairly established and so then we're really working with them to develop their own financial sustainability plan so that they can continue their projects in the future. Mm -hmm. They remain part of the network after that. No one's kicked out after three years. We're a big family. Um, <laughs> so they still have access to um, trainings, workshops, and all that kind of learning opportunity. And how about community partners? Our community partners are amazing. We couldn't do this without community partners. Um, we work with a number of different agencies and also partner with NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, the Massachusetts chapter. Mm -hmm. They provide technical expertise um, and really support us and the agencies in uh, managing their projects. And um, one of our amazing partner agencies is the Boys and Girls Club of Chicopee, mm -hmm. where we've just been delighted to work for the last couple of years. Yeah, so Jamie, we're gonna bring you in now and mm -hmm. have you talk about how the program has impacted the Boys and Girls Club of Chicopee. 
Um, so originally we started with Rachel's Table um, in their food rescue um, portion that they do. Uh, in the Boys and Girls Club of Chicopee, we offer a lot of different programs and one of those is providing uh, teen dinners three days a week. Um, so they have been a great help with um, supplying us with different food items. Um, and then with me being in my nutri nutrition department, um, I knew the garden kind of went hand in hand, but I needed a little bit of support <laughs> and education um, and it seemed like a big thing to take on on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so they were able to refer us over to the Growing Gardens where we joined into that program. And um, now we have a working garden that, well last year we, we had our entire garden um, that with their support we were able to um, actually pr grow stuff and have um, vegetables and herbs um, and create a, a program, an extra program space at the club for the, the youth to go out and explore and learn new things. Um, and then also the impact of them just being that support, um, troubleshooting, the education portion. And um, this year we're actually expanding the garden, making it way bigger <laughs> with their support. Um, I feel like without them, I would not have the confidence to do that. Um, so yeah, they've been a huge impact and will continue to be able to do that um, with it being a multi-year program. Mm -hmm. So that's what your involvement, you know, sort of looked like. Mm -hmm. You know, what do the kids love most about the garden? We had a picture of them popped up. <laughs> very, very, very cute. So, you know, what do yeah, they love about it? So just getting outside, getting their hands dirty. Um, I think with the garden, it's really nice because they don't really know what to expect. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're going to find when they go out there. So it's kind of like a little treasure hunt for them. Um, they go out there and they connect with their food. They see, oh, a cucumber and they just can pull it right off the vine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really exciting for them. Um, and just seeing things grow, being able to kind of go in the garden. Um, so it's just another fun space for them. And the chickens. Oh, so we, we did <laughs> introduce chickens this year um, and it kind of went hand in hand with the garden. Mm -hmm. Um, and we got them from baby chicks, so that was super exciting for all of the youth. Um, and just another way for them to connect their food in a different way. Like they, they know what chicken is, but have they seen the life cycle of a chicken right. and got to hold them and see them as babies. So that's been really exciting. They really love the chickens. <laughs> yeah, and being in a city, you know, like Chicopee, being exposed to, like you said, farm animals, stuff like that, you know, it's yeah. really cool for them. Yeah, and even some of like the, the basic vegetables that they just, don't really understand how it starts. So starting it from the beginning, being able to put seeds in the ground and seeing that they can create their own food. Mm -hmm. So that's been really exciting and they really love it. Yeah, and you know, lastly, how can our community help support this endeavor and uh, volunteers? Do we need volunteers? Always, we always need volunteers. Um, we al always need donations of time, materials, money. Those are always the things that um, that can help. And so if uh, folks have particular skill sets, um, for example, around carpentry for mm -hmm. building raised beds or building compost bins or building tool sheds, um, that's a skill set that's always helpful. Um, if folks just have um, a lot of experience with growing food and um, some of that technical knowledge about how to identify what nutrients are the plants are deficient in, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, are some of the skill sets that we're always looking for. And we also have big garden build days. We actually just came from mm -hmm. one a couple hours ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we had a whole group of volunteers out um, hauling mulch around and building mm -hmm. beds. Um, so we have a few opportunities like that each year as well. Yeah. And lastly, how can an organization apply to your program? Um, just reach out to us, mm -hmm. um, email, uh, give us a call. Um, we're always just looking to find the right fit. Um, it's not so much an application program as figuring out, is this the right fit? And is this the right time? Sometimes for an agency, they're really interested, but the right time is maybe next year rather than this year. Mm -hmm. um, so just reach out. We'd love to have a conversation. Okay, Kara, Jamie, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Teens play an important role in projects and events at Rachel's Table, and we'll be talking about what they do once we return. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. I'm Ciara Speller and we're talking with representatives from Rachel's Table, a hunger and food waste reduction organization. An important part of the organization is the involvement of youth. So here now to discuss Rachel's Table Teen Board, our president, Franza Mizimaka and Melina Frickion, Vice President of the Rachel's Table Teen Board. So thank you both for being here so much. Thank you for having yeah. us. So tell us, you know, what is the Teen Board? So the Teen Board is a teen education, leadership, and ag advocacy group built off of the adult board, which we've seen tonight. It's built up of a bunch of teens who care about the same issues and want to make a change in the community. We're all from Western Massachusetts, and we're able to work together to fight the same cause. Yeah, and how about your mission? So our mission of the Teen Board is to alleviate childhood hunger, educate youth about food insecurity, and advocate for food justice in Western Mass through events and meetings, which we have monthly. And how about, you know, tell us about why it's important for teens to be involved in this type of work. You know, it seems like a pretty daunting task, right? Fighting, you know, food insecurity and making this mm -hmm. message heard. So for teens to get involved. So teens of the future. Um, mm -hmm. We're growing up and as we grow up, if we start young, we're able to continue this passion throughout our lives and get our friends in along the way. A big part of it is the outreach. We have officers who are dedicated to outreaching and reaching out to kids in their schools and their friend groups and their sports teams. And we're able to gain a lot of um, new members that way so they can care about the issue throughout their lifetime and you know, stick, stick with it. Yeah, did you want to add to yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of people who face food insecurity are children who are in schools and mm -hmm. they can't really get a good education if in class they're unable to focus because they're hungry or distracted by the hunger in their stomachs. Mm -hmm. And tell us, you know, why each of you decided to get involved. I'll go first. On that. <laughs> I decided to get involved because when I was a freshman in high school, my sister was on the teen board with her friends. And through the work they did, I attended some of the meetings and I saw that what they're doing is really important. and the work they're doing isn't just impacting them, it's impacting hundreds of people in mm -hmm. Western Massachusetts. And if I'm able to help with just a small part of that, it's like amazing. And I decided to join the teen board and be an officer because I'd been on the board for two years before I ran for president. And I realized that if what I'm doing can help like only like a couple people, if the more I do, the more people I can help and the more power I can have on it. Yeah. For me, I was also a freshman and um, my swim team captain was the president and she was big on outreach and getting people to join and go to meetings and stuff. So one day I joined a meeting and I was really impacted by what, what was said and I wanted to be able to make a change and help out. So I joined the next year and was more of a member and more dedicated. So in my junior year I ran as an officer and I just wanted to be able to um, have my say in what we're doing and have a bigger impact. Um, on the greater good that we were doing. Yeah, so you were both saying that you um, knew somebody that was involved beforehand and that inspired you to get involved. So with you now in these positions, have you inspired other people, maybe your peers to get involved as well? Yeah, a lot of our friends have joined the teen board along with us. So our sophomore and junior and senior year. And we've recruited, I think around like 10 new members this past two yeah. years, mm -hmm. so yeah. So we get members who come and go or stay. So last mm -hmm. year my position was the membership membership and outreach mm -hmm. so I was meant to get new members to come and join and try it out and tell their friends yeah and tell us about what types of events that you organize so we have many different events they go from gardening um, we have the Calica milk drive we also do the Holyoke backpack program and we do a program for the Ronald McDonald house mm -hmm. so we either are able to get food to people or make the food for people at the Ronald McDonald house and we just really hope to educate a lot of people on how serious of an issue food insecurity is. Yeah. We also host um, one meeting um, every month. We have a meeting and an event every month. Mm -hmm. So at the meeting, we'll talk about the event we previously hosted or the event that's upcoming. So we'll discuss what happened, we'll debrief on it, or we'll prepare for the next event and what's to come, how we're going to outreach it, what we're going to post about it to get people to come, and all of that as well as we'll talk about the different programs of food insecurity. We often talk about SNAP and WIC and all the things that impact our local community to educate ourselves and make a change on it. And how about volunteering opportunities? So volunteering opportunities are open to all middle schoolers and teens mm -hmm. in anywhere <laughs> if they're willing to come. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, we have 
like I said, the one meeting and one event a month. So either of those you can volunteer for, and um, we accept anyone. Some people come once to one event, and mm -hmm. then they'll just co come and go because it's through the school or through their friend, but some will stay, and we accept. We like everyone's help, so. And a lot of people come for different reasons for community service, whether they need for a school or like a service <coughs> group that they're in, so yeah. And you had mentioned um, about 10 new members you thought throughout the last two years. How mm -hmm. many teens do you have on your board right now? So we have seven officers and about 20 members mm -hmm. within that, but those yeah. fluctuate. So. Yeah, like, I, like we said, um, we have members who will come to every meeting and then we have members who will come and go, so mm -hmm. it depends, but it, it fluctuates around that. Yeah, and in terms of age, is it pretty, you know, across the board, or do you have, you know, like you said, middle schoolers or high schoolers primarily? So our youngest member is in eighth grade, mm -hmm. right? Or she's seventh been, grade. But she's she, been coming since she was in younger. sixth grade, sixth grade I, I want to say. So, yeah. but it fluctuates from yeah. that to all the way through high school, mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. if like you were on Rachel's table or a sibling of, and you had graduated, you're always welcome to come back and help out. Mm -hmm. Our last year's president was actually advocating for Rachel's table at her college recently, which wow. is really nice to see. Yeah, that is nice. And how about, you know, eligibility? How do you join? So anyone can join, really anyone's welcome. We have meetings once a sun every Sunday once a month, mm -hmm. and um, we have an Instagram, Rachel's Table Teens, and we also have a TikTok, Rachel's Table Teen Board 1, and we post when our meetings and when our events are going to be on there. Yeah, and for our um, viewers that might just be joining right now, talk about your roles. What do you do specifically in your roles? So as president, my role is to help people's ideas, whether what kind of events we kind of have, want to have, or what type of we, what we want to talk about at meetings. Mm -hmm. I also help with outreach. I kind of just like oversee how everything's done, but also I try and help educate as many people as I can by reaching out to new members, reaching out to help with the board itself, mm -hmm. yeah. So as vice president, I do pretty much the same thing. I help uh, help her with that, and um, a lot oftentimes we'll join the um, adult board meetings and we'll oversee that and get some insight and update them on what we're what we're doing. Um, we help coordinate events. This year we've tried to each um, each officer has like chosen an event to really host and put their input into mm -hmm. um, to like make their own. So. We do that, a lot of that, and like assisting the other officers and doing kind of the more one-on-one -on -one stuff with our teen board coordinator, Sarah, and we'll, we'll assist with that and kind of do more of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And how about some you know, big projects or big events that you guys are working on? Our big event that we have is May 19th. It's called Outrun Hunger. Jody talked about it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a 5K run or a one-mile fun walk, and we'll also have a story walk for children there. And that event is mostly ran volunteer-wise by teens. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the teen boards and members can also come to join. And we'll either be like directing traffic, helping runners, guiding people where to go. And we look for a lot of people to come join the race. Mm -hmm. So if you're at home, please join the race. <laughs> and yeah. Yep. Did you want to add to that? Um, just that's our, we have biannual like large events. Mm -hmm. That's our large event for the year. Last year was Art Fest for us. So this year, we kind of spent the whole year working towards it in some aspect, mm -hmm. so we're very excited for it. All right, well, thank you both for being here. I love what you said, you know, our youth are our future, so hopefully you're inspiring more people to join you guys and help you achieve all your goals. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rachel's Table depends on a community of volunteers to reach their goals, so find out how you can lend a hand after the break. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Thanks for staying with 22 News in Focus. The many programs offered through Rachel's Table are successful due in large part to their dedicated volunteers. Rachel's Table considers itself volunteer driven. So here now to talk about the importance of volunteers are Steve Lipo and Marla Adelsberger, volunteers at Rachel's Table for Western Massachusetts. So thanks so much for being here and tell us about what made you want to get involved with Rachel's Table. I'm actually the second generation um, of my family with Rachel Stable. Uh, my parents used to volunteer, and uh, when I retired, I decided that I wanted to volunteer as well. And Marla, how about for you? 
Um, I actually became familiar with uh, Rachel's Table through the Bountiful Bowls program that a friend of mine with his students was producing the beautiful bowls that you mentioned <laughs> um, and I was helping him doing the glazing and I got to go to the event and I thought that was pretty interesting so I kind of when I had some time I started uh, I signed up to do some driving and kind of put my toe in the water mm -hmm. and then at the start of the pandemic when things got so scary and it was so clear how many people were having a really hard time with food insecurity um, I decided I needed to do more and I just said yes to every opportunity with Rachel's Table and they did an amazing job of pivoting and really expanding their programs so there were lots of things that I could say yes to. And how long have both of you been involved? I've been involved for four years. Wow. And about the same, and about, about the same. The same. Yeah. Although lots of our volunteers can say, you know, 20 years, mm -hmm. 25 years, many, many years. Mm -hmm. So in, in that way, I think we're kind of newbies. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it's, it's great that you're, you're so committed. And let's talk about some of those programs. Can you be involved in more than one program as a volunteer? Absolutely. Steve, why don't you say a little bit about what you do, and then I can kind of add. I'm the van coordinator for Rachel's Table. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I was a driver. And uh, when Rachel's Table got a van a year and a half ago, they asked if I would be the coordinator for it. So I do the scheduling for it. Um, I've got a great bunch, um, bunch of people on my crew. We've got 12 people, both male and female. Mm -hmm. And how about you? So, we, so definitely, I do food rescue, I drive. I don't have a van, but <laughs> um, I do my car. So there's an opportunity there for people to volunteer with food rescue, with dispatching, sending the drivers out on their routes, driving. Um, with the farmer's markets, we have folks picking up at the end of the market and bringing that food, beautiful fresh produce to um, our partner agencies. For purchasing food, there's an opportunity for people to get involved in that. Certainly with gleaning and um, certainly with growing gardens. So there's an opportunity in each of the areas that we're involved with. Also with special events, like you've been hearing about Outrun Hunger and Bountiful mm -hmm. Bowls, um, and even office work. There's an opportunity for people to do things there. There's always you know, um, organizing uh, literature that's going out or social media, all sorts of things there. I think the really, one of the things that I love about Rachel's Table is you can be like Steve, who volunteers most of his waking hours mm -hmm. to, to doing the van, or you can be someone who volunteers one day a month mm -hmm. or periodically. So there's an opportunity to get involved in so many varieties of ways. Yeah, so. let's talk a little bit about the van. What role does the van play in Rachel's Table's delivery? Well, the van has enabled us to actually double the amount of food that we um, that we receive from yeah. different food donors. Um, we get food from supermarkets, uh, from restaurants, and from um, CNS wholesale mm -hmm. um, distributors. And um, we have a set schedule uh, every morning. Um, I tell my van drivers that um, we're moving target. <laughs> you never know when my cell phone's going to go, mm -hmm. and there's a an additional pickup. Yeah, and so tell us about how many volunteers do you have at Rachel's Table right now? Well, there's over 300 volunteers. A significant percentage of those are drivers and dispatchers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a six day a week operation, so we need as many volunteers as we can get. And people, we have a lot of regular drivers, but people go on vacation. We could be always happy to have subs and additional people coming in. But there's a lot of people that will do the gleaning or they'll do one particular program that they're connected with. So we have, like I said, over 300, but we could use more. So. And are there specific programs that need more volunteers or is it just, you know? I think across the, I'd say mm -hmm. across the board, uh, um, to, or to say it the other way, I think there's an opportunity for someone with an interest to find a place where they could, where they would enjoy and it would be a good fit for them. Mm -hmm. so. And do you need to um, apply to become a volunteer? What's that process look like? They would either contact uh, our office or um, go on our website um, to get more information. And when it comes to uh, van drivers, um, they get, vetted by, they have to bring their license mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. copy of their driving record, um, and, you know, before they can actually get on the van and then they go through a training period. Mm -hmm. And what's that training period like? It's basically going out on the road um, 
with a um, person that we have that's from the transportation industry and uh, he gives pointers to them, um, things you don't even think about. Yeah. And is there specific times that you've thought, wow, we really could use more volunteers, specific times in the year, or is it just year round? I, I would say year round mm -hmm. in the winter time, we have a lot of volunteers that go south for the winter, mm -hmm. so we have a great need um, then. Um, basically year round, uh, we, mm -hmm. we always can use additional volunteers. Mm -hmm. Though we have dispatchers that are snowbirds, they go south for the winter, mm -hmm. and they'll continue to dispatch from wherever they are. Mm -hmm. So it, it speaks to their commitment and yeah. how important this is for them. Yeah, and what's, how old is your, your youngest volunteer? Well, you, you heard from the team board members. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, you know, kids ride with their parents mm -hmm. when they're doing when they're doing deliveries, pickups, and deliveries. Um, we have a gentleman who's still driving, who I think is ninety-two. Wow. George is um, mm -hmm. so he's been doing it for a long time, and um, both two of his children are driving too. Look at so, that! You yeah. know, like you said, family involvement yeah. and yeah. seeing it other generations getting involved, and it's great to like you said, 92, have somebody that can still be involved and willing to help, that's yeah. great. Yeah, we have a lot of second generation drivers. There's, um, you know, there was a wonderful group that started Rachel's Table in the beginning and some of those have stepped back, but their children have carried on the tradition and it's something that is really valued by people who have been involved. And what's the best way for somebody to maybe reach out and find out about volunteering? Would they be able to speak with a volunteer about their personal experiences? Yeah, absolutely. So if uh, people go to the website, which is? Um, feedwma.org, mm -hmm. or they could call the office, mm -hmm. and the office number is 73. Yeah, we have that number up right there mm -hmm. for okay. our viewers, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, and they'll hear from someone very quickly. If someone is interested in gleaning and they check that off, mm -hmm. they'll hear from Kara Silverberg. If they're interested in um, driving or dispatching, they'll hear from Kathy in the office. So so their application, if you will, or their, their, um, their interest will go to whomever they'd be responsible to. But they'll hear from a live human being very quickly after yeah. that. And just quickly before we go to the break, what mm -hmm. has been your both of your favorite parts about this, being involved? I like the fact that uh, every, every day changes mm -hmm. um, because we got a phone call. We, like last week, we picked up uh, 3,800 pounds um, from one of the food donors. Um, today, we got a phone call from uh, Westfield State University, mm -hmm. and they've got food for us to pick up uh, tomorrow. And how about you, Marla? Um, I think I love what I'm doing and I do a variety of things but I think what's most important for me is that w I know that what we're doing matters mm -hmm. that it makes a difference yes so. yeah it makes a difference and however much time you can volunteer is going to help make a that's difference. right exactly right. thank you both for yes. being on the program we thank appreciate you so that. much thank you and I'll have some final remarks once we return you're watching 22 news in focus You've been watching 22 News in Focus, and today we've been talking with representatives from Rachel's Table, an organization that helps fight hunger in our region. We want to thank all of our viewers at home for watching our program today and thank our, our representatives for being on the program and providing such valuable information. Again, thank you so much for watching, and if you missed any part of the program, you can find it on our website at WWLP.com. From all of us here at 22 News, have a great day.